because respect, philosophically, as in Aristotle, for instance, respect, as you know better than I, uh, literally means to look again, to look, and not to narrow the phenomenon or the person by one's pre-judgments, by one's prejudices. So, to respect a person, especially a person very different from oneself in form of life, but a fellow human being, means to look before you think. You think from the concrete experience rather than from abstractions to the concrete experience. So it's really life which makes, it's making like the Greek poem, it's a poetic making, which makes the philosophy rather than the philosophy which makes the life. So in this way, Aristotle <laughs> entered the room, you might say. And of course, Aristotle, as one, I'm, as you know, I'm not a specialist in ancient philosophy. I start as a specialist in the 17th century. But nonetheless, Aristotle is one, I believe, one of the greatest philosophers of ethics. I mean, the Nicomachean ethics is still now, this day, one of the most resourceful works for moral thought and moral action. Um, so, in, in an, another way in which Aristotle entered in um, had to do with this young man's question, is what I do bad? In other words, the question of good and bad moral good and evil arose. And he thought initially that, you know, I, I'm a scholar of philosophy, so I know the definition. I know <laughs> the difference between good and bad, and I can tell him, and then he can find out if he's good or bad. And of course, this is not how it works. <coughs> the, the field enlarged itself, and I should say right away that I don't use term philosophical terminology or philosophers' names in the counseling room unless my interlocutor uh, has a philosophical education, has a formal philosophical education. So I never talked about Aristotle or Kant or whoever to this young man. It would have been intimidating. It would have been alienating. So the, the vocabulary, the style of the dialogue between us is really a function and a development from the narrative, from the story that the person tells me and from the way they talk. I still talk as I talk, but in resonance with the other person. So I don't talk as an academic unless I talk with a fellow academic. So we, we developed our own dialogical style. Intanto la dimensione del rispetto. Il momento in cui l'altra persona è davanti, in qualche modo io devo fare la poetica della vita, osservando, guardando imparando dalla vita e non funzionando con dei preconcetti a priori per cui io applico i miei preconcetti sulla vita, ma al contrario, io prendo da questa persona che è di fronte a me con rispetto, cercando di cogliere in modo a prioristico, a, 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 a concettuale, dalla vita, dall'espressione. E eh, l'altra necessità qual è? sempre nell'ambito di questo rispetto, a parte la questione di Aristotele che qui entra soprattutto perché eh, dal punto di vista etico eh, la domanda di questa persona era ma io faccio bene o faccio male, la mia vita è giusta o sbagliata, eh, io impersonifico il bene o il male, no? a questo punto era possibile in qualche modo eh, dare il 
concetto del bene e del male perché la filosofia ce lo insegna perché Aristotele ci curava mai in questo ma non era questo che era necessario fare era necessario in qualche modo porsi eh, ad un livello che non fosse accademico che non fosse un livello di insegnamento ma che eh, lavorando con il materiale e con l'osservazione con lo, la persona che è di fronte per riuscire a instaurare un'interazione su un linguaggio non accademico, non formale, ma che fosse un'interazione con rispetto alla pari sul, sul campo che era proprio di quella persona che stava lì davanti. So the, the dialogue in, in the council room um, is in an important sense a self-to-self dialogue. There is some kind of hierarchy because it's in my office, it's at a time, I mean the amount of time uh, is determined by me. My sessions last one hour, a bit more, a bit less. Um, but otherwise, there, well, maybe there is a bit more, not hierarchy, but difference. It's a self-to-self -self dialogue, but I don't talk about my own experience. Except, I said this to you yesterday, um, except in one way, and here I have to enlarge a little bit, um, most people who come to any counselor need help. This is obvious. And some pe the people who come to me come with the same kinds of problems and issues that they would go or have gone or are going to psychotherapists, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists with. So they come with the same kinds of problems. Um, very often, as you know, at least as well as I, um, problems which are tied to depression, anxiety, um, low self-esteem, um, difficult human relationships and so forth. Most of these problems, in our Western world at least, are very isolated. So very often people with diverse problems have one problem in common, loneliness. Mm -hmm. Hmm? I mean, recently, well, I'll say this later. I, I'll talk about this first. Um, so loneliness is a fairly common factor, amazingly so. And it's very often the root of the acute suffering of the soul or of the mind. And sometimes when I recognize, or quite often, when I recognize um, that I have had or have a very similar experience, and that I know it from within. I say, I know what this feels like. I have experienced something similar. And this is sometimes very important and liberating, because um, then the person, um, not always, but often, feels that she, he is not alone. And when they ask me, how did you do it, and how was it for you? I, I say, well, look, we are talking about you. You know, we are not talking about my life story. But I have been in a very similar space. And sometimes they say, how long ago? And I say, a year ago, or 10 years ago, whatever. But to that extent, I cross the boundary, so to speak, and say something personal without going into detail.